Okay, well, today we're going to talk about energy and regulation of biological processes. And for me, this is something that comes fairly naturally because my background is in physical sciences. For biology students, when we talk about things like thermodynamics and kinetics, people get nervous, okay? And maybe you should get nervous because it's not something that in general you're used to thinking about in a biological context. But I hope you'll see both by the end of today's lecture and by the end of the semester that thermodynamics and kinetics underlies every single thing that happens in biology. If we're going to understand what's happening at the molecular level or if we're going to understand what's happening at the ecosystem level, you cannot do it without an appreciation for thermodynamics and kinetics. So hopefully today you'll get uh, a reasonable introduction to this and between the lecture and the readings and practicing stuff, it will make sense to you. But this stuff is going to come up again and again and again over the course of the semester. So if you're having problems with it, if it doesn't make sense to you, come see me or Simon during office hours or make an appointment with us or whatever. Don't let it go. All right. So we talked about uh, in the lecture on Tuesday the idea that plant physiology basically is everything that happens in a plant. Everything that happens in the plant is determined by chemical reactions. Chemical reactions we know or you should know in some sense are at least in theory reversible. They can go from reactants to products or they can go from products to reactants depending upon some characteristics of the environment that these reactions are going on in. These reactions can go slowly or not at all or very quickly. Again, depending upon the environment that these reactions are going on in. So what we want to do is talk today about thermodynamics. And in a practical sense, when we think about thermodynamics, we're thinking about change in energy associated with a reaction. And we'll see that the practical context of this is it gives us information about the direction of the reaction. And in that sense, I mean, if we think about when we give the name reactants and products, we're sort of implying a direction we want the reaction to go. So reactants, I'll abbreviate R, and products, I'll abbreviate P. And we draw the arrow going in one direction because we're sort of assuming that's the direction we want the reaction to go. But in reality, every reaction is to some degree reversible. Right, so which direction that goes, reactants to products or products to reactants, is something that thermodynamics can tell us and therefore is very important in understanding biological reactions. Let's think about glucose. Converting CO2 and water to glucose is the opposite reaction of converting glucose to CO2 and water. One of those reactions releases a lot of available energy. The other one requires an input of energy which one that is and which direction goes spontaneously is within the realm of thermodynamics. Kinetics, on the other hand, is completely related to rate of reaction. If a reaction can proceed from reactants to products, at what speed does, does that happen? And how do we adjust in the context of an enzyme? How do we adjust the rate of the reaction? We can imagine that we either have no enzyme present or lots of enzyme present. So the reaction doesn't happen or does happen. But there's lots of ways to adjust it much more finely tuned than that. <coughs> OK, so we said that thermodynamics and kinetics depend upon characteristics of the environment. The main characteristic that we need to think about is energy. The energy of the reactants and products, the energy of the environment that these are in, and what sort of things has to happen to convert the reactants into the products. So when we think about energy, what are we talking about? 
What's energy? Can you see it? Depends on how you define. You can see light, right? And light is energy. There's energy in light. But in general, we don't see it. Energy, the easiest way to define it or to think about it is how it affects matter. The ability to do work on matter. In the macroscopic sense, we're all familiar with this. You know, I have to move this controller along the table or to lift it up. I have to do mechanical work. I'm working against friction or I'm working against gravity. But most of the things that we're going to be talking about over the course of the semester are things that are happening at the cellular and molecular level. So what are some examples of work that can be done at the cellular or molecular level? Yeah? Yeah, making gradients, moving, moving solutes or ions across membranes. That's one example. Something else? Yeah? Yeah, making ATP or using ATP, hydrolyzing ATP, right, to produce energy. What else? Yeah? Yeah, moving things around structurally in the cell, changing the shape of the cell, moving vesicles around, yeah, all these sorts of things. So there's lots of different ways that energy can be used at the molecular and cellular level in a biological sense. And what we need to do is think about how that energy, how these processes are constrained by thermodynamics or, and kinetics. Or we can turn it around. How, does, how do kinetics and thermodynamics give us the possibility of controlling biological reactions? Because it should be clear to you that in life, reactions that underlie life are not random. They are highly controlled in terms of rate and the direction that they go and the amount of energy that they use. Okay, so what we want to understand is how thermodynamics and kinetics put constraints on this. Okay, so kinetic versus potential energy, we've all heard of this. What do we mean when we talk about kinetic energy? What's kinetic energy? Yeah, energy related to motion. So a car or a truck going down Tower Road. But how about at the molecular level? Same thing, right? The movement of molecules. Whether we're talking about the translation of a molecule in three dimensions, the rotation of a molecule around its some axis, or the vibration of atoms within the molecule, all those different forms of movement represent kinetic energy. At the molecular level, we refer to this kinetic energy as thermal energy. And the reason we, we call it thermal energy is because it's related to temperature. If we turn the temperature up, the motion of the molecule, whether it's translation, rotation, or vibration, all of those motions increase. Now, with modern uh, types of microscopes, atomic force microscopes and stuff like that, we're starting to be able to see, literally visualize, thermal energy. But it's a lot easier to see the effect of thermal energy <coughs> on small particles. It's something you've all seen before. It's Brownian motion. So here's a little video of Brownian motion. So these are tiny oil droplets, about a micron in diameter. And if you look at them, I hope you can see that they're jiggling around. What's making those little oil droplets in water jiggle around? Yeah, the movement of the water molecules around them. Those water molecules are translating and rotating and vibrating. And when they bump into those oil droplets, they cause them to move around a little bit. At the molecular level, what is one of the most important consequences of this motion? Temperature is certainly part of it, yeah. It's sort of, it's a chicken and an egg thing in terms of what determines what. Yeah, reactions happen when collisions happen. And so if you have a, the one reactant here and one reactant here, then that motion can bring them together and allow that reaction to happen. What do we call that motion that moves things around in some specific way? Yeah? 
You know the answer to this. I'm just, just not asking the question very well. Diffusion. Diffusion is completely dependent on this thermal motion. So if I open a jar of perfume up here, if there was no air currents in the room, the molecules of that jar of perfume would spread throughout the room within a couple of minutes simply by thermal motion of the molecules in the air, the, the, the gas molecules in the air bumping around the molecules of perfume that are coming out of the bottle. They would spread out. Okay? So we'll see that this thermal motion, this thermal energy associated with the environment turns out to be critically important in the thermodynamics and kinetics of biological reactions. So let's just keep in mind that it's there for now. All right, the other aspect of, of energy that we want to think about is potential energy. Potential energy is energy associated with the position of matter in some sort of a field. The one we're most familiar with is gravitational potential. If I lift this controller up, I'm raising it up in a gravitational field. That potential energy can be converted into electric, or sorry, kinetic energy if I drop it, right? right? So there's energy in the potential field associated with gravity. What are the potential energy fields that we can be thinking about in terms of atoms and molecules? Yeah, so there can be electrical potential. So imagine that I have a plus charge here and a minus charge here, and I put something that's got a positive charge in between them. Work can be done on this charged particle by the field. It will move away from the positive and towards the negative. Right? Just like the controller drops in a gravitational field. The presence of that field is allowing work to be done on that particle. Okay, what else besides electrical potential can influence things at the level of molecules? Magnetic, um, magnetic it's, you could say it's the same or different depending upon how you define things in physics, but it's certainly related to that, so we could say electrical. That turns out to be very important in biological systems. Magnetic. Yep, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, sure, chemical bonds, another one. How about the perfume bottle? Yeah, mass gradients, right? Isn't there energy associated with mass gradients? We will. Anything else? Got to add a few more to this. Pressure. Pressure can cause molecules to move from one place to another. So if I uh, have a um, glass of water on the table and a straw, if I suck on that straw, will it pull the molecules up? Yeah, so it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a fire hose at the macroscopic level or whether we're talking about water moving through plasma desmata at the molecular level or at the cellular level. Pressure can drive the movement of things. A um, couple other ones that we need to think about um, that we'll discuss over the course of the semester, redox potential. Remember this from chemistry, oxidation, reduction reactions, the, the willingness of, of molecules to give up or accept electrons. So electron transport that we talk about in photosynthesis and respiration is entirely due to redox potential. Okay, so we got a bunch of different types of energy that we need to be thinking about. And these will come up in a lot of different circumstances. So for example, when we're talking about movement of water in plants. We're going to need to talk about pressure potential and we're going to need to talk about mass gradients. Okay. When we talk about electron transport, we're going to need to think about redox potential.
and mass gradients. When we talk about um, respiration and photosynthesis, we're going to need to talk about chemical bonds and electrical um, interactions. So these are going to come up in a lot of different circumstances. Okay, so let's think for a minute. Let's step back and consider one of the things that confuses biology students about thermodynamics to no end. And these are the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, so the first law. Who remembers what the first law is? I don't expect you to know this. It's basically, energy is conserved. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can just change its forms. Okay. Second law. Yeah, second law has to do with entropy. The second law basically says that reactions can happen or processes can happen if the net of that process increases the entropy of the universe. So processes occur spontaneously if the entropy and we'll talk about entropy in just a second. And we need to be careful, entropy of the universe increases. OK. So you can memorize these. But if you don't understand the consequences that these have for biological systems, you're screwed. Right? It doesn't do any good to know the facts if you can't apply them. So let me give you something that you should be able to apply these two in a biological context. Let's think about, take a single bacterial cell, okay? And we're going to give that bacterial cell a nice nutrient broth to grow in. That bacterial cell, we're going to give it some glucose and some amino acids and basically all the small molecules it needs to grow. You know what? We've got to step back for just a second because I forgot we've got to define what entropy is. What do we mean by entropy? Disorder. Yeah, disorder, randomness, chaos, all, all, all correct. Right? And quantifying entropy is something you don't need to worry about. But thinking about entropy as the degree of disorder is very useful in a lot of different biological contexts. One of the most simple ones is diffusion. Right? If I have a bottle of perfume where all the perfume molecules are concentrated up here, and I open that bottle of perfume, we've got all the molecules concentrated here, but we've got the whole room that those molecules could fill up. So there's a lot higher entropy, oh, sorry, a lot lower entropy in the concentrated bottle of perfume. If we let those molecules spread out over a bigger volume, we're increasing the disorder. We're increasing the entropy there. Okay? So what this basically means is for a process to happen, the entropy of the universe, the changes in the entropy of the universe associated with that process has to increase. Okay? You all right with that? That simple enough, I hope? All right, so let's go back to the example. We're grow, we've got a single bacterial cell in this culture of simple molecules, sugars and amino acids and things like that, things the bacteria needs to grow. Come back a couple days later, and you've got a bazillion of these bacterial cells, each of which is composed of very complex molecules, proteins and nucleic acids and fatty acids and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So the process of growth, life, has taken a whole bunch of simple molecules and made something very complicated. Doesn't that disobey the second law of thermodynamics? Okay, so I got two different answers, no and yes. First of all, 
one of the things you have to accept about laws is that through our experience in science, it works. If it didn't work, we wouldn't call it a law anymore. We change laws all the time. The law of gravity is being rewritten as we learn about cosmology, as we learn about things that are happening on time scales or uh, spatial scales of the universe. Right? Newton's law of gravity is pretty much correct for what we you know, experience on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's not correct for things that happen over very long distances and very long times. But we re re rewrite that law to, to take into account things. So if we call something a law, everything that we know must work. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it a law. It would be a theory. Okay. So the, e the easy part of this is that if, uh, if we call it a law, it must work. So now your responsibility is to explain to me how life does not disobey the second law of thermodynamics, when you take a broth full of simple molecules in a single cell and convert that into a bunch of very complicated organisms, complicated molecules, has the entropy of the organism, or the, the number of organisms there, has that entropy increased or decreased? Does it become more ordered or less ordered? If you're converting simple molecules into complicated molecules, more ordered or less ordered? Much more ordered. So is that increasing or decreasing entropy? It's decreasing entropy. Okay. So the second law tells us life should not work. But I'm telling you that because it's a law, it does work. We're missing something. What are we missing in terms of entropy increasing overall with this process? Anna. Okay. Okay, so part of it part of what you're saying is there's some energy involved in this that we're not seeing, but we still have to account for th this doesn't say anything about the form of of different forms of energy. It just says entropy's got to increase. Does life increase the amount of disorder? Yes, it absolutely does. Explain to me how. No, no, well, let, me, let me stop you. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we're starting, our, we defined a system. The system is a batch of molecules that we put in there, glucose and amino acids. Okay? Now, we're, we don't really care at this point how you had to make those glucose and amino acids. What we want to know is the chemical reaction we're talking about is taking that glucose and amino acids and making more complicated proteins and nucleic acids. Those reactions would appear on the surface to be decreasing entropy, making things more complicated. Well, there's heat created. Say that again? There's heat oh, created. there's heat created. I so does so. the process of growth generate heat? Yes. yes, every biological reaction has heat as a side reaction. right? And heat is contributing to thermal energy, disorder. If you raise the temperature, that's contributing to it. We're still missing one other really important thing. Yes. Didn't we just say before with the perfume bottle that if we have a higher concentration of something, that we have less entropy? And so if we uptake the um, amount of molecules that were in the solution before and transfer to something different, then the um, concentration will decrease and we would have more. Yeah, so you're de decreasing the concentration of the solutes that the organisms are taking up, but you're actually increasing the concentration of those complicated molecules, right? Yeah, so here's, here's the, the giveaway that you're not thinking about. For every glucose molecule that those bacteria take up, does the carbon in those glucose molecules all go to make proteins and fatty acids and nucleic acids? Respiration, right? A lot of that stuff got used to, dr to produce the energy that Anna was talking about. And in that production of energy, what do we get out of that besides energy? CO2, water. In fact, you get about 10 times as much of the sugar that's used up 
to make to make the energy and making CO2 and water is you do the complicated molecules at the end. So where's all that entropy coming from? Two things. The heat that's generated and all those simple molecules that are produced in respiration. So, the, so life does not disobey the second law of thermodynamics. The problem was that we were only thinking about the organism and not the organism's environment. Right? The organism produces a lot of CO2 and water from respiration that's released into the environment. It produces a lot of heat. This is the level that I want you to be able to think about these things. I want you to incorporate relatively simple principles to understand how these things work at the level of biological reactions. You really need to be able to do that. And we'll give you some practice at that. Let's, give it, let's take another one. That same example. Is the first law of thermodynamics being illustrated in this example of the bacteria growing from these simple molecules? In what way? Somebody give me an explanation of how that's happening. Whatever goes into the process of making light happen, the same amount of energy that goes in comes out. Okay. Nothing is created or destroyed. Okay, so um, tell me how the energy is going in in this particular example and how it's coming out. Um, it's going in, the bacteria will take it in from the external environment. In what form? Uh, light energy. No, oh, these are not photosynthetic bacteria. Through food. Yeah, through the stuff they eat, through the chemical bonds in the glucose molecules and the amino acids that they break down in respiration. Okay, so how is that energy coming out? Come out through respiration or um, the energy. Respiration is a process, it's not a form of energy. What's the form of energy? We're, we're trying to balance energy in and energy out, right? So you told me that energy goes in from the chemical bonds in the molecules it's using up. How does the energy come out? Through waste. What, what's the, what waste are we talking about? Is ATP waste? Well, not waste, but... Okay, so ATP is produced. Does ATP accumulate in an organism? No. Right, so if you're making ATP, but you're using it as well, right, to do cellular processes. So is there work being done from that energy at the cellular level? Yeah. Yes. Of course. Every bit of energy from those, that respiration that's conserved as ATP is used to do cellular work, whether it's to drive chemical reactions or make gradients or move things around. It's being used to do work. Is that the only place the energy is going? Where else? Um, the energy is being released as heat. Heat? It's um, doing work immediately as ATP. It's being built up into more complex molecules. Yeah, so you also have energy in the chemical bonds of the more complex molecules, right? One more thing. Wait, what, which ones do we need? How about entropy? Is entropy a form of energy? Is it a component of energy? So this is the next thing we want to talk about. This is one of these equations that you should know, not in terms of knowing the equation, but you should know what it means. So what's S here? Entropy. What's G? It's the free energy. And what does free energy mean? Yeah, it's energy that can be used to do work, whether we're talking about macroscopic. When, when all these equations were put together, people were studying steam engines. But this is just as applicable, applicable to microscopic things, to atomic level reactions. So this is energy that can do work. How about, what's H? Enthalpy. Okay, I don't care that you know the name. What does that mean? Well, it's related to heat, yeah. But in the context of... Yeah, it's basically, we should say it's the total energy. It's an easier way to think about it, okay? Okay. 
So here's the total energy. Here's the energy that's available to do work. What's this T delta S then? Is this energy? Absolutely. But this is energy that's not available to do work. Okay, so you can think of enthalpy as the total amount of energy you put into a process. Some of that energy is available to do work. And this is the stuff that we're, we're going to be most concerned with. In the T delta S, then, is energy that cannot be used, that cannot do work. So we put these two things together that the entropy of the universe must increase. So what does that mean that every chemical reaction has got to make some entropy? It's got to increase entropy. So what does that mean about could we have a chemical process where the energy that we put in is equal to the amount of energy that we can do work with? No. So what does that mean about the efficiency of any process? It's got to be less than 100%. Right? If the second law of thermodynamics holds true, there always must be some energy lost from the system in the form of entropy. Okay? So we've learned several very important things from this first two laws in this simple equation. This is the level I want you to be able to think about this. You're never, you don't have to memorize this equation. If you need to, you can look it up. What you need to be able to do is understand how this contributes at the level of atoms and molecules and cells so that we can understand plant physiology. OK? Question? Can you, can you repeat like, what comes out from the food? Like, what comes out from the food? What are the forms of energy that come out of the system? So we're putting energy in in small molecules, right? So energy can come out in the larger molecules that are in the organisms, right? Energy can come out in heat that is dissipated in the environment. Energy comes out in the disorder of the smaller molecules, the CO2 and water, that are also produced. OK? You OK with that? All right. OK, so let's move forward then. So here's another picture just to help you visualize this thermal motion. This is uh, a computer simulation of the movement of a glucose molecule in a 10 micron by 10 micron by 10 micron cube. So about the size of a small plant cell. And it's the motion that occurs in 20 seconds. So the path represents the translation of the molecule in three dimensions. The colors represent the orientation, that is, the tumbling or the rotation of the molecule. And there's no vibration shown on here. But what you should take away from this is if that was a glucose molecule, it's moving around, if that's a small plant cell, it's moving around the cell quite a bit. It takes about, on average, a second for a glucose molecule to move across the, the, the width of a small plant cell. In other words, diffusion at the cellular level is plenty fast enough to move molecules around, to mix them up in the cytoplasm, at least of a, of a small cell. We'll talk about what happens in larger cells as well. Okay? So when we think about glycolysis, a series of chemical reactions that are happening in the cytoplasm, are the enzymes of glycolysis attached to one another? No, they're floating around free. So how does the product of the first enzyme get to the second enzyme to function in the chemical reaction? Diffusion. That's it. Right? It's really important that you grasp the, import, the, the process of diffusion. How does a transcription factor bi find the spot on the DNA that it needs to bind to? It's just random diffusion. There are no little railroad tracks that those proteins are moving on. It's just random diffusion. And you've got to grasp that in terms of a process that's important to, to, to understanding how these processes are occurring. OK, so let's step back for a second and think about 
very general chemical reactions. And we're going to think about those chemical reactions in two different, let's say, dimensions. One of these dimensions is the free energy change associated with the reaction. Okay? We're always concerned about free energy because that's energy that's available to do work. We know this exists. We know it's produced. But we're not really concerned about it because we can't do anything with it at the cellular level. We're concerned with the energy we can do something with. So we're talking about the change in free energy of a reaction. And that change, it's important to keep in mind, the delta G is equal to, when we're talking about a chemical reaction, it's the G of the products minus the G of the reactants. Or if we want to be completely general, it's the G of the final state minus the G of the initial state. You know, we could have defined it the other way. Some chemist or physicist just decided to do it this way. So in reality, we are never concerned about the actual free energy of a single component of a system. We're only interested in the change in free energy that accompanies a reaction or a process. Okay? So on the y-axis here, we're plotting free energy change. And the energy that we're using is kilocalories per mole. Is that familiar to you? What's a calorie? Yeah, what's a calorie? How much energy is a calorie? <laughs> Yeah, right. Raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Right? Okay. Actually, it turns out the calories are a reasonably large amount of energy. Right? So here we're talking about kilocalories, 1,000 calories per mole of whatever process we're talking about there. Okay? So here's a, here's a good standard to keep in mind. Thermal energy The amount of energy that's available simply due to motion of molecules at a specific temperature. At 25 degrees Celsius is about 2 kilocalories per mole. That's energy that's free in the environment simply due to the motion of molecules. And we'll see this turns out to be really important in a lot of biological processes. Right? So we're looking at changes in free energy that are on the same scale as the thermal energy that's available in the environment. Right? On the x-axis, we're plotting the ratio of the concentration of products to the concentration of reactants. That's what reactants, that's what these brackets mean, concentration. So if you have a reaction A plus B going to C plus D, the reactants would be the concentration of A times the concentration of B, and for the products would be the concentration of C times the concentration of D. You are never in this class going to have to put numbers in and plug and chug. But I'm going to give you lots of uh, chances to think about this in a qualitative sense. If we do this to the system, how will it change the free energy? Not by how much. Just will it make it larger or smaller? Things like that. Those are the things I want you to understand. OK? OK with what we got here on the diagram? OK. So what does it mean to have a free energy of 0, free energy change of 0 associated with a reaction or a process? Yeah, it's equilibrium. So what do we mean by equilibrium? Yeah, in the green. Yeah, so the amount of reaction that goes this way is equal to the amount of reaction that goes this way. doesn't mean the reaction stopped. It just means the forward and reverse rates are the same. Okay? So the question is, what's the concentration of reactants and products at that equilibrium condition? That's where we're going to start this discussion. And this is totally, totally arbitrary because every reaction has a specific equilibrium point. So we can imagine some reaction where the equilibrium point is 100 times more product than reactant. 
if we're thinking about reactions that's go, that are going from left to right, we would call that a favorable reaction, right? Because most of the reactants are being converted into products. But we could also imagine a reaction that has an equilibrium point where only the ratio is 10 to 1. So that means for every 90 products, we still have 10 reactants. Okay? We could also imagine a reaction where it's the other way around, where the equilibrium point is more reactants than products. That would be what we might call an unfavorable reaction. Okay? Every chemical reaction has a unique equilibrium point that depends upon complicated characteristics of the reaction that we just don't care about. But it is critical that you understand that every reaction has a unique equilibrium point. Okay? So the next question we need to ask is, what happens if we change the ratio of reactants to products away from that equilibrium point? Say that again. Yeah, okay. So in other words, if we, if we go with this reaction, if we go to higher products and reactants, then our intuition tells us that something will happen to bring us back to that equilibrium point, right? In other words, we're, what we're saying is there's energy available to do the chemical work to get us from one ratio of reactants to products back to this equilibrium point. If we draw a graph of that, what does that graph look like? Well, here's a graph for the first one. So it tells us as we make more reactants relative to products, we have a negative free energy. And one of the things that we need to, so you just sort of accept at this point. If you want to go back to chemistry and learn about it, um, you can. But if the delta G is less than zero, if it's negative, if the delta G for a process, if the products have less energy than the reactants, then the reaction can, and I'll emphasize can, be spontaneous. It can proceed from reactants to products. So if we raise the amount of reactants relative to products, we make the delta G more negative, and the reaction wants to proceed back towards the equilibrium point. How about if we go in the other direction? How about if we make more products than reactants? If we're down here, is the reaction going to go? Will a reaction happen if we're down here? No, you're wrong. It goes this way towards the equilibrium point, converting products to reactants. The reaction is running in the opposite direction. You know this. You just haven't thought about it. Let's think of the reaction. Converting glucose plus oxygen to CO2 and water. Right? So the delta G for this reaction, as it's written, is about minus 670 kilocalories per mole. You don't have to know that number. Energy is available if you break down glucose into smaller molecules. How about photosynthesis? Goes the other way, right? What's the delta G for that reaction? Positive 670, right? It's the opposite, right? So when you reverse the direction of the reaction, you reverse the sign. So what does that mean about photosynthesis in terms of energy? Yeah, you've got to put energy in, right? You know that. Energy comes from sunlight, right? So what I want you to do is take these practical things that you're aware of and put it in the context of free energy changes. If you move away from the equilibrium point where you're producing more, where you're adding more reactants than products, the reaction will go spontaneously back towards the equilibrium point from reactants to products with a negative delta G. If you go more products than reactants, 
The reaction will still go spontaneously, but it goes in the opposite direction, converting products back into reactants, always stopping at that equilibrium point. Okay? So if we're down here, let's, let's, let, let me skip that for a second. I'll come back to it. How about if we look at the, the line for the blue reaction or the green reaction? The intercept is different. But interestingly, the slope of the line is the same. This is what makes chemistry palatable. It doesn't care what the nature of the products and reactants are. The slope of this line, the change in free energy, only depends on the concentration of the products and reactants. It doesn't care what the products and reactants are. The, what the products and reactants are only determines that equilibrium point, not the slope. So that slope is... RT, where T is the temperature in degrees Kelvin, and R is the universal gas constant. Where do you think the universal gas constant was determined from? Measuring the slope of these lines. Right. Turns out R is useful in all sorts of different things in, in chemistry and physics, but this is where it came from. The recognition that for chemical reactions, it doesn't care what the reaction is. The change in the free energy, which changes in the products and reactants, doesn't care about what the reaction is. It only cares about the ratio of reactants and products and how far those differ from the equilibrium point. Right? So as we move further and further away from the equilibrium point, there's more free energy available to drive the reaction back to the equilibrium point. Right? Once you get to the equilibrium point, there's no longer any free energy left to drive things. The reactions are still going on, but they're equal in, in the opposite directions. Okay? Is this making sense? Please tell me if it's not. If you don't want to tell me now, come see in office hours or something, because this is important. But this is, this is really cool. I mean, if you think about it, it's unbelievably cool. Because it means that all chemical reactions behave exactly the same in terms of the change in free energy associated with changes in the concentration of reactants and products. It doesn't matter what the reaction is. The only thing we need to know is what this equilibrium point is. Okay? So you learned about this in chemistry. you learned that this equilibrium concentration has something to do with the energy content of the system. And the reason that you, the reason that you did this is because chemists and physicists like to define what they call standard conditions. In chemistry, the standard condition is the concentration of the reactants, is equal to the concentration of the products, is equal to one molar. Okay? So the standard conditions on this graph is this vertical dotted line. Equal concentrations of reactants and products. Right? And the energy for any one of these reactions that's available to drive the reaction to equilibrium is called the delta G zero. The delta G zero is the free energy available for any reaction from this initial standard condition, one molar reactants and one molar products, till it reaches equilibrium. Okay? So for this reaction, the delta G zero is going to be something like minus three and a half kilocalories per mole. For this reaction, the delta G zero is going to be positive. So the plus and minus signs give us some idea of where the equilibrium is displaced compared to the one-to-one. -one. Minus signs mean they're displaced towards products. Plus signs mean they're displaced towards reactants. That's something that you should immediately recognize. If the delta G for a reaction is positive, delta G zero for a reaction is positive, it means that, that the equilibrium point is towards reactants. Sorry. Yeah, towards reactants from the, from the standard conditions. Yeah. And how big the number is, 
is how far that equilibrium point is displaced. So something that's got a delta G0 of minus 600 kilocalories per mole is going to be way over here, right? You're going to go from, reactant, from reactants almost completely to products. So those delta G zeros are actually useful numbers in terms of telling you where the equilibrium point is relative to this. Anything with a very large positive or negative delta G is the equilibrium point is displaced a long ways from that one. Question? Um, will no. That's why, remember when I wrote that out up here? I underlined can. Doesn't mean that it will. Here's a good example. ATP. ATP plus water Right? Delta G. It's negative. So if I put ATP in, in water, what will happen? Nothing. Nothing. Right? It only tells you that it can happen. It doesn't tell you that it will happen. That's kinetics. We'll get to that in just a second. Okay? Right? So it only tells you, well, it can happen. It doesn't tell you how fast it will happen. And, and if we put ATP in water and waited a million years, this would happen. But if we wait a couple hours, it won't happen at all. It's a very, very slow reaction. We'll get there, OK? All right, so one last thing. We need to think about what the delta G for a reaction is for initial Ratios, ratios of reactants and products that are different than these standard conditions. Right? How often do we, do we find one molar ATP, one molar water, one molar ADP, and one molar phosphate in a cell? Never. Never. So if we want to know what the delta G is for a chemical reaction under the precise conditions, we want to know what it is we displace ourselves somewhere from this delta G zero, right? So we know that if we go in this direction, the delta G should become more negative. Or if we go in this direction, the delta G should become less negative or more positive, right? So you know the equation, but now it should make more sense to you. Is that right? Is that right? You're all busy writing it down. I want you to use your brains. Is that equation right? Does it make sense to you? If we increase the amount of products relative to reactants, What is is the, the log of that going to be more positive or negative? Okay, So that means this term is going to get larger. This negative term is going to get smaller. So if we make more products than reactants, is this going in the right direction? No, it's backwards. I did that on purpose. This is, you should be able to look at this right away and say, wait, it makes that doesn't make sense. It's backwards. It should be going the other way. It should be becoming more negative not, or more positive, not more negative. If we make more products relative to reactants, which way do we move on this graph? This way? This way or that way? This way, right? What's happening to the delta G? It's becoming more positive. Remember, that this thing is upside down. Right? You need to be able to see th simple things like this because these are the things that allow you to evaluate, wait a minute, am I doing this right? Or have I got my sign backwards? Or have I got products and reactants mixed up or something like that? You have to be able to see whether this makes sense. For some of you right now, this may be challenging. But this is what I want you to be comfortable with. OK. Let's just take a minute to apply this. this. This works really well for chemical reactions, like the ATP or glucose or things like that. How well does this work for diffusion? Let's, make, let's take a simple diffusion problem. 
Here's a cell. You recognize it right away, right? And let's assume that we have some molecule that is permeable through the membrane. It can get through the membrane. And that the concentration outside the cell is greater than the concentration inside the cell. Okay? So what's your intuition tell you? What's going to happen? Okay? So that C is going to move from the outside to the inside. So what must the delta G for this process be if C is going to move spontaneously from outside to inside? Negative, right? Okay, so then how do we express this in the same context that we're thinking about here? How do we express the change in free energy associated with C moving from outside to inside? It's basically the same equation. Now let's see if we can figure out, if you get confused, where do we put C out and C in? We, our, our intuition told us if C out is greater than C in, that it should diffuse in, right? So that means if it's going to diffuse in, the delta G is going to be negative. So we want this term to be negative. So do we put C out in the numerator or C out in the denominator? C out, which is bigger? C out. So does it go in the numerator or the denominator? Remember, do you know how to use natural logs? Logs. If it's less than one, it's negative. If it's greater than one, it's positive. If it's one, it's zero. Right. So it must be C out down here and C in. I'm trying to get you to see that you don't even need to remember the equation. You just use your intuition, and you can figure it out. Okay. Okay, one last thing. What happens if C is charged? Does it make a difference? Un okay, maybe. Under what conditions would it make a difference? Yeah, so remember when we talked about before when we had positive and negative charges and if we put a plus charge here, we say it's going to move in this direction? If there's no charges, if there's no electric field, then the charge makes no difference. Only the concentration contributes. But if there's an electric field, it will contribute as well. And the way it contributes, the delta G component associated with electrical fields is equal to NF delta psi. N is the charge on the the thing that's moving. F is a constant, sort of like the gas constants, Faraday's constant. You don't need to know the value. And delta psi is the membrane potential. And this is probably the most confusing thing that we'll talk about today, what membrane potential is and why we give it the value that it does. All cells have a membrane potential that's more negative on the inside and more positive on the outside. We'll understand the consequences of this in a couple lectures when we talk about transport processes and membranes. But all cells, bacteria, plants, animals, they generate that charge difference in different ways, but they all have more positive outside than inside. Okay? And the way we describe this, the way the membrane potential, this delta psi, is described is the potential inside relative to outside if you make the outside zero. So what's going to be the sign of the membrane potential if we're asking, if we say the membrane potential is the inside relative to the outside? Negative, right? So for all cells, the delta psi is less than zero. For plants, it's typically minus 80 to minus, uh, minus 120 millivolts millivolts. Voltage is a me measure of electrical potential. Right? So it's always, let's put it this way, under normal circumstances, the membrane potential is always more positive outside, or the membrane potential, as we, we typically say it, is more negative inside compared to outside. Okay, so now, let's say that C has a plus charge. Is the 
electrical potential going to facilitate C moving in or is it going to inhibit C moving in? It's going to facilitate it. If C had a negative charge, it would be inhibiting it. So the only thing that we need to do when we have charged species is to sum together the free energy components that are due to the electrical potential and the chemical potential. Right? So we would just need to add to this term There's a concentration or a mass term here, and there's an electrical term here. Okay, and this is called the Nernst equation. We're going to use this a lot when we talk about transport, because many of the things that we're going to transport across plant cells are going to be things like nitrate ions, or sulfate ions, or protons, or chloride ions. They have charge. Right? So we need to take this the concentration gradient and the mass, uh, the electrical gradient, both into consideration. Let me just finish with the thermodynamics part about this with something that helps you remember the relative importance of concentration versus electrical gradients. Let's take the non-trivial equilibrium condition where delta G is equal to zero, but the concentration gradient is not zero and the electrical gradient is not zero, okay? So it would be trivial if these were both zero. So that means then these must be equal in amplitude but opposite in sign, right? So we could say that RT log concentration in over concentration out is equal to minus NF delta psi, okay? So, and let's assume that the membrane potential for a plant cell is minus 100 millivolts. Let's ask, ah, you know what, let's change this around. Let's do, a, there's an easier way to do this. Let's assume that the concentration gradient, it's a 10x concentration gradient with 10 times more outside than inside. Okay? So if we have a 10x concentration gradient here, what's the size of the membrane potential that will just balance this? Right? So there's energy associated with the concentration gradient that should let, let C move in. Let's assume that C has a negative charge and that the electrical component is equal to but opposite to that. So the delta G for the whole process is zero. There's no net movement. What would the size of the membrane potential have to be to just balance this factor of 10 concentration? It's about 60 millivolts, minus 60 millivolts. Right? This is a really good piece of information to keep in the back of your mind, that for a monovalent ion, you need about 60 millivolts of membrane potential to just balance a factor of 10 concentration. I will give you questions on exams and on uh, homework where you could plug and chug and get an answer. But you don't need to do that. If you know this fact, the only thing that I'm going to be asking is, let's say the membrane potential is 100 millivolts and there's a factor of 10 concentration. The membrane potential is minus 100 millivolts, and we've got a factor of 10 concentration. Which way will it move in? Which way will it move, in or out? This is trying to make it move in. This is balancing it. If we make it more negative, more negative inside than outside, is that going to try and push it in, or is it going to try and pull it out? Yeah. Right? So this is what I want you to be able to do. Right? So... You can, you can get to the answer by plugging and chugging, but you're wasting your time. You should be able to determine it by using things like this. Okay? If you're uncomfortable with this, there are several questions in the supplementary study questions that talk about these sorts of things. Okay? And there'll be more of it coming up when we talk about ion transport. Okay. So as usual, I'm running a little longer than I wanted to. So some of what we're going to talk about in lecture topic two will have to carry over to the next lecture. But let's think about 
kinetic snow. Let's think about how energy plays a role in determining how fast a reaction is. We've done the direction, right? We can figure out the direction from the sign of the delta G. But we want to know how fast a reaction is going to go. And energy plays a role in this as well. But the role it plays is somewhat different. So here's a diagram that probably most of you have seen. Let's label that diagram a little bit. So we're putting free energy change on the y-axis. And we're putting the progress of the reaction on the x-axis. And the progress of the reaction going from reactants to products in that sort of high area there on the graph is referred to as the transition state. OK, this is the key. If you understand this, you understand all the kinetic stuff that you need to know for, for this course. The, in going from reactants to products, so the difference between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products, that's the delta G. Is the delta G positive or negative for this reaction? Negative, right? Because the, the, the products have less energy than the reactants. So should this reaction occur spontaneously? Yes, it can. The question is, how fast does it happen? And what is it about this diagram that determines how fast the reaction happens? OK, yeah, the B, activation energy. That's, that's the right answer. But now you have to explain to me why. Why is it that making B larger makes the reaction go slower? Or making B smaller makes the reaction go faster? Somebody else. Anna. Uh, well, you need, you need a certain amount of energy to kind of the reaction. But B is really large, it might take a while to get Yeah, so we, when we say this is the progress of the reaction, this represents the energy of the reaction in configurations as they go from pure reactants to pure products. This transition state is something in between there. And it tells us to go through that transition state, you've got to put energy in. Where's that energy coming from for any chemical reaction that can happen at a measurable rate? Where's that energy coming from? Where's the energy coming? The Paul guy here with the glasses, sorry. If it's from outside the system, then I guess the sun. If it's inside the system, then breaking other, other bonds? No. Right. no it's a, that's a perfectly acceptable answer from you know completely general perspective. But it, in, in practice, it never happens. If the energy of the products was higher than that of the reactants, what you said would be correct. Take the energy from some other source to give you that net energy you need to go from products to reactants. But to get over this barrier, ATP or sunlight never used. So is it just kinetics? Yeah. What, what, can, where, when we say kinetics, what? What's the source of that energy? Temperature. Temperature, yeah. Thermal motion. It's that number, 2 kilocalories per mole. Right? So let's consider a chemical reaction. Imagine that the, well, let's step back for just a second. The rate of the reaction is going to be determined by what fraction of the reactants have sufficient energy to get over that barrier. That make sense? That should be relatively intuitive. OK, so let's imagine a reaction where, at any given time, 10% of the reactants have energy to get over that barrier. OK? Make sense? What do we call that reaction? No, it's very favorable. Will that reaction go slowly or quickly? If 10% had quickly. Reactions like that we call explosions. What about a reaction that happens um, at a reasonable rate in our cells, a thousand times per second? What fraction of the reactants have the energy to get over that activation energy barrier if it happens a thousand times a second? At any given incident time, what fraction? I don't expect you to know the actual answer. But it's small. It's like 1 in 10 to the 8th. Okay? So measurable biological reactions happen with a very small fraction of molecules having enough energy to get over that barrier. 
If you have lots, the reaction goes really fast. Right? We don't like reactions like that in biological systems. Right? We like the reactions to go at slow, measurable, controlled rates. Not like taking hydrogen and oxygen in a balloon and holding a match to the balloon. That reaction is over just like that. Right? Because every molecule inside there is going to have the energy to get over that barrier. Okay. So, we said that for ATP, for example, if we put ATP in a jar, we can leave it there for a thousand years and only a few molecules will get converted, even though the delta G is very negative. So what does that mean about the number of ATP molecules that have the energy to get over that barrier? Almost none. Almost none, right? But we know in biological reactions that the rate of ATP hydrolysis can be fast, thousands per second by an, an ATP hydrolyzing enzyme. So what is happening in biological systems to allow enzymes to make the rate of reactions go faster? No. You lower the yeah, you lower the activation energy barrier, right? So we go from the red line being a non-catalyzed reaction to the black line being a catalyzed reaction. You lower the activation energy barrier. So let's just finish by thinking about what's the characteristic of this transition state? Because that's really what we're changing here, right? We're not changing the energy of the reactants or the products. The delta G of the reaction has not changed. That's important for an enzyme reaction. Enzymes do not change the delta G. They only change the activation energy barrier. So we have to know what's the, what is giving rise to this higher energy of the transition state. So if we have what is happening to convert the chemical bonds in A and B to the chemical bonds in C and D. You can be changing the conformation of the molecule. Let's assume that what we're doing is we're breaking and forming covalent bonds. What do we need to do to form a new covalent bond? Let's, let's make it even simpler. Joining two molecules to form one. Right? So let's, this could be glucose plus sucrose. Sorry, glucose plus fructose makes sucrose. We're making a new chemical bond that isn't there. What do we need to do to make a chemical bond? What's happening at this transition state? You know the answer to this. You're just not thinking about it. What is a chemical bond for making a covalent bond? What's a covalent bond? Yeah, sharing of two electrons. Okay, So we've got an electron on A and an electron on B. Right? And those electrons we want to bring together so they're, they're shared in a, in a chemical bond. Before that bond forms, we've got to bring them together. Do electrons attract or repulse? They repulse. So they don't want to come together. It takes energy to push them together. right? And let's just say that electron is pointing, here's A and here's B. And this is the, the orbital that those electrons are in. They're positioned in a specific place relative to the nucleus. What happens if A and B come together like this? You're going to form a chemical bond? No. So there's an orientation component. In other words, think about it in terms of entropy. Random. Non-random. If we want to make something non-random, we've got to put energy in. Right? So two of the main things that contribute to this activation energy barrier are electron orbital penetration, making two negative charges come together to form that covalent bond, and just the orientation factors. And you know how this works. You know that an enzyme has an active site that fits the molecule in there in such a way that facilitates the electron orbitals penetrating each other and things coming together in the right orientation so that you can make or break bonds. Straightforward? You've heard this. Here's a more complicated diagram based on actual structures. This is an enzyme called hexokinase that binds glucose and sticks a phosphate from ATP onto it. So when the glucose binds, the protein changes its shape. That induced fit sort of thing. That change in shape is part of what gives rise to that decrease in the activation energy. Right? It's bringing in new reactions, new interactions that weren't there before that make things have the right orientation. 
that make, that make it easier to bring electrons together to form or break uh, bonds. Okay, so it's the protein shape that's doing this. Okay, so now we can, we, we'll, I'll lead you into something we'll start off with next time. How do we regulate the activity of this enzyme? How do we crank up its activity or turn down its activity? How do we make the rate of a reaction go faster or slower? Temperature? temperature, sure, would be one, right? Can plants control temperature? Do you make a reaction go faster in you by raising your temperature? N only under very few conditions. No. Your temperature remains constant. Right? If you have a fever, you raise the temperature. But how would we normally do that? Concentration. Concentration would be one way. But how do we do it by altering the enzyme? Um, we want to make a reaction go faster. What are we going to do? How do we do that? No. No, we'll, we'll talk about that, but that won't change the rate of the reaction. More enzyme would be one way to do it, yes. But how do we change it by changing just the enzyme? Look at the picture. If we want to make the reaction go faster, if we just have one enzyme, we want to make that enzyme work faster, what do we do? And what does that do in this context? In the context of this diagram right here in front of us. Yeah, right? So the shape of the enzyme is related to the activation energy, right? You can put the enzyme in a shape that will make this activation energy higher. That slows the enzyme down. You could make the shape of the enzyme so that activation energy barrier is lower. Speeds enzymes up. That's how enzyme regulation happens. We'll talk about that. We'll pick up at that point next time. We'll only take maybe five minutes to finish that up before we go into lecture topic three. But think about that. There's nothing, there's no rocket science here. You've got to relate the properties of the enzyme, what's happening at this transition state, to how changes in the structure of the enzyme can either raise or lower that activation energy and therefore turn up or turn down the rate of the reaction. That's, that's enzyme regulation. If you got that, you got it. That's how it happens. You've heard of allosteric regulation? That's it. Okay, we'll pick up there next time.